Hey guys, it's Faye from Solar Flow, and I am back with an all new video. Today's topic is a deep dive behind the veil energy read on the Kardashians. We are going to be exploring their tremendous three dimensional financial success. What is the contributing factor to that? What does that have to do with Kris Jenner? As well as peeling back the three dimensional veil and exploring what is going on behind the veil with the Kardashians. So if that sounds good to you, please stick around. And if not, I will catch you at another video. Now, first and foremost, I had done two previous shorter segments on the Kardashians for previous AMAs, which I have linked down below and you are welcome to go back and watch. So you might be wondering though, okay, Faye, you've already done two previous segments on the Kardashians. Why are you doing a whole standalone video dedicated to them? And that is because one day I was sitting down to meditate and as I tend to, and sometimes when I'm meditating, I ask to look into a specific topic and sometimes I'm just open-minded. I'm like, whatever wants to come in can come in. And boy, did their fucking energy come in. Now I'm going to be very upfront and I'm going to say I'm not particular fans of theirs. I've never actually even seen an episode of the Kardashians. Except like if I was in the nail salon and you know how like the nail salon is, um, is playing something on like if they have a TV. So sometimes they were playing episodes. Now it's around me. I can't completely block it out, right? If it's playing, I'll hear it, but I wasn't like giving my active energy and attention to. I've just never really been fans of theirs. They kind of just give me the heebie jeebies. And that was kind of like solidified in what came up when I had done the uh, looking into their energy for the for the AMA, which we're going to discuss here and as well. So their energy had come in big time, and it was interesting that was coming in. So I was uh, keeping myself open and amenable to receiving more information. And holy fucking hell, it was like a geyser. I have like 13 pages of additional notes to share with you guys. Now, first and foremost, when I had sat down to connect to their energy, I was immediately directed to look into their financial success, which is kind of a funny place to start. But once I had done that and I had sat back down to meditate, it was directly connected to what had come in in the channeled energy read. So I am going to start there. And then as always, I am going to be using my notebook. This, I think I have something like 12 or 13 pages of channeled information. There's no way to remember all of it. I'm not even going to try. So I use my notebook so I can stick to the information that has come in because that is brought to be brought to me by my guides. And as we all know, the guides bring the goods. You're here for the guides. I'm here for the guides. Let's give them their due by following the information that they have brought into me. Okay. So first and foremost, um, what is their estimated net worth? And this is what I found out after doing a 10 second Google search. So the Kardashians have an estimated net worth of over $2 billion. And I was like, okay, that's kind of interesting, but I'm curious like what each individual's net worth is broken down. So I had done a second search and this is what the information had yielded to me. So I'm going to be going in order of um, most financially successful to least financially successful. And yes, this all does tie in as well. Okay, so first and foremost, Kim has an estimated net worth of 1.8 billion, with a B, billion dollars. This is attributed to first and foremost her um, Skims brand, I think they make like undergarments. Um, she has like a makeup brand and then like endorsements and then she charges an insane amount of money to also um, promote companies and brands on her social media. Kylie is next in line with an estimated net worth of $750 million. And this is attributed to her cosmetic line. I think it's called like Kylie Cosmetics or something. I'm not really sure. Kris Jenner is next. She has an estimated net worth of $230 million. 
And part of that is in fact due to the 10% cut that she receives as her children's so-called momager. And a momager is a combination of mom and manager because she is their manager. So she gets a 10% cut on every single deal that they make and the 10% cut of the finances. Now, Courtney is next in line and Courtney has an estimated net worth of 65 million, followed by Kendall with an estimated net worth of 60 million and Chloe as well with 60 million. Interestingly enough, Rob Kardashian, which is the son has the lowest net worth of only, <laughs> only uh, $10 million. That's gonna come into play also. All right, so now that we have taken the three-dimensional information that I was directed to look into, let's get into the channeled goodies. Okay, so what was immediately shown to me after I had acquired this information is as follows. You want to know how much someone has sacrificed to, the, to join the club? Look to see how successful they are in the 3D. So the fact that the last name Kardashian, right? Keeping up with the Kardashians, what they were like on the E! Network for 20 years with their so-called reality TV show. So the fact that the last name Kardashian is a household name, plus the fact that all the girls themselves are household names, speaks volumes as to how much was sacrificed for it. And it all began with Chris. Chris being the mother, Chris being the matriarch, Chris being the momager. It all began with her. Sweet little Chris, who was never actually sweet, but incredibly cunning. And she was shown to me as having an innate ability at zeroing in on a person's weakness or their own perceived weakness and to then exploit it. She was incredibly cutting with her words and could cut someone down to size verbally. And what's worse is that they never even saw it coming. Now this very much goes hand in hand with what had come through when I had looked into the Kardashians in an AMA and specifically into Kanye, which was the way the family had first been presented to him was they were like this strong united front, they all had each other's back and they were incredibly uh, cohesive and loving and um, uh, like they were all just very, very close. And while that was something that he had initially been very drawn in by, what soon became apparent to him was the fact that he could not make decisions for himself and for his family because those decisions would actually were uh, being made by Kim and by Chris and how then did he even allow this to happen was because Chris would say things to him and cut him down to size verbally. And then he would be so taken aback by it and so shocked by it. It was like, I think the example I had given, it was like, he, like imagine you fell down a flight of stairs. You fall down a flight of stairs, you're not jumping up. You're like gonna lay there for a good couple of seconds. You're gonna scan your body and be like, am I okay? Is anything broken? Does anything hurt? Am I alive? Like what the? Now imagine if it was Kanye that had fallen down the flight of stairs and he realized he was pushed down the flight of stairs by Kris Jenner. So he was completely like taken aback and like thrown off guard after energetically being thrown down a flight of stairs by the words that Kris Jenner would use to him. So he was not in himself, he was not fully empowered and fully embodied because of it. And that was what was a way in which decisions were being made for him because he was energetically at a disempowered state because of what? Because of the words that Kris Jenner would use to cut him down to size. She didn't just do this with Kanye. She did this to everybody. 
And the worst part is they would never even see it coming because one day she would say she loved you, one day she would say she hated you, and you would never know what side of the bed you would wake up on in the morning. You know, like, how does the expression go? I woke up on the cranky side of the bed or I woke up on the refreshed side of the bed. No one actually knew with Chris what side of the bed they were on for her in any particular given day because she was so prone to like these weird bouts of like moodiness. I love you, I hate you, and every single variation in between. It was incredibly disorientating for the members of the family growing up in a household with a woman like that where they never knew where they stood with her. And that was by design. That was not coincidental. She was mostly able to get what she wanted because of this. So this was a form of emotional and mental manipulation. She would get what she wanted by terrorizing her family because her words could create little incision marks like a knife would, and the person would slowly, energetically bleed out. And what happened to Kanye was just at a very, very elevated and rapid rate. But she had been doing this to the members of her own family and her own children for decades prior to them even becoming adults. So, as a matter of self-preservation, her family members would just give in to her. Because she was slowly creating these micro tears in them, they were slowly energetically bleeding out, and as a form of their self-preservation, whether they were acknowledging that it was energetic or it was something else, they would just end up uh, giving in to her. Now, because she was so adept at zeroing in on people's real or imagined weaknesses, right? Because like, let's say for example, um, here's the example that I, I give. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not particularly good at math. So if somebody wanted to use that against me, they could, and they knew that I wasn't particularly good at math, they could like make fun of me, right? They could say any number of horrible things about how I am not good in math. Okay, I know that about myself. Would it be kind that somebody would be doing that? No, not necessarily. But would it take me by surprise if somebody did that? I mean, I, it's kind of like a joke between me and my mom how not good I am at math. But she chooses being a loving, kind, compassionate human being not to make nasty jokes about it. Chris would. She knew what somebody was not good at and she would take that dagger and she would just turn it and turn it and turn it to continuously remind them how not adept they were at something. So that's the things that somebody might know about themselves. But imagine if you will, somebody had a different kind of a weakness where they believed something about themselves to be true. And it might not even be real. It's just a perception that somebody might have about themselves. So let's say, I, I know I'm not good at math, but let's say I also believe that I'm not, um, let's say I'm not, I believe that I'm not good at decorating. Now I happen to be good at decorating, but let's say despite all of my best efforts, I'm reading magazines and I'm looking at influencers' homes and I'm trying to arrange my house to look in such a certain kind of a way. And I still never feel, because it doesn't look like the way it looks in magazines, I just never feel good about my decorating abilities because of it. So somebody like a Kris Jenner, who is very, very adept at zeroing in on a perceived weakness that a person has, would look at that and she would continue to exploit that person's perceived weakness to her advantage. So let's say Kris Jenner would come over to my house uh, and she's a friend of mine and I just finished redecorating it and I was like, look around, like, look, what do you, what do you think of what I did? And understanding again that I'm trying to get out ahead of it and act like I'm confident in it, but in fact, I'm not confident. And that's why I'm like asking her what she thinks as a way of trying to get like, uh, to fish for a compliment, let's say. This being a person that would understand this is a perceived weakness I would have, would probably make a very passive aggressive comment 
as to the way in which I would decorate my home. Maybe it would be something to, to the effect of like, you know, oh, don't quit your day job. Or maybe you should stick to what you're doing because you actually suck at decorating. Or maybe it would even be something to the effect of like, well, you know what, it's a good thing you're not a paid influencer because no one would pay you for this. There's any number of ways that a person could cut somebody down to size verbally if they understood what their perceived weakness was. And that is exactly what Kris Jenner would do. So she would exploit not only the things that they know they were not good at, i.e. math, but she would continue to negatively reinforce erroneous beliefs that a person would have themselves as well. So she then, therefore, because she was so adept at exploiting known or perceived weaknesses, she also knew exactly how to exploit Robert's weakness to stay with her. Now, Robert is the, uh, the first man that she was married to and is the father of, I want to say maybe the, the th I think the three oldest uh, Kardashian girls. Uh, she is, I, he was, I think, the father to Kim, Courtney, and Chloe, and then Kris Jenner had uh, divorced him, and then she had married uh, Bruce Jenner, and they, I believe, had Kylie and Kendall, if I'm not mistaken. So what does this have to do with her being so adept at exploiting people's perceived weaknesses? Aha! Robert, her first husband, had longed to always feel like he himself belonged somewhere. And what is one of the best ways to assure that you feel like you belong somewhere? It's to have a family of your own and to have a house of your own and to have children of your own. He always longed to feel like he himself belonged somewhere. And that was the motivation in him wanting to marry Kris Jenner because how was she going to ensure that feeling of belonging? By making sure they had a large family together. Right? Your home with me is now where you belong. Your children with me is now where you belong. This is our home. This is our family together. Which sounds lovely if it wasn't with somebody like a Kris Jenner. Right? Not somebody that was incredibly manipulative and would mentally and emotionally manipulate her family to receive what she herself wanted. So understand her even having children with Robert was an attempt to manipulate him and to make sure that he stayed with her. Because um, the idea for them to have a lot of kids was for her to trap him further because with each subsequent child that they would have together, it would reinforce in him a sense of duty and responsibility. And that in the moments when he would become well and truly fed up with Kris Jenner, she would tell him that first and foremost, the kids would never want to see him again and how would she ensure it because she would be telling the kids your dad gave up on you therefore that would be severing his feeling for the first time in his life of actually belonging somewhere because she would take his family away from him and how would she take his family away from him by telling the children your dad gave up on you even though it was her who was actually um, behaving in such a way that would make him feel truly fed up to the extent that he was actually willing to walk away. So he would lose the only belonging he had ever felt in his whole entire life and that was why he had stayed as long as he did. Now she is a, Chris, is a master manipulator and felt absolutely no remorse for the lies that she had said because she is very much the kind of person where the ends justify the means. And what does it mean? What, is, what does that expression mean? It doesn't matter what we do along the way as long as we get the desired outcome that we want. And what was the desired outcome that Robert wanted? Well, he always got the family that he wanted, didn't he? Okay, so he, all, he finally felt like he had some place that he belonged. So he finally got what he would, what he wanted. So who cares about how we got him, how he got there? I gave him what he always wanted. It didn't matter that it was through 
manipulative means. So she always felt like, what right did he really have to complain about all of this then? She gave him what he wanted. However, because they did at some point actually become divorced. So however, at one point, Robert felt well and truly done and was in fact shown to me as being near suicidal because of her. He had been so completely energetically drained that he didn't care if his kids never in fact spoke to him again because if he stayed with her, he might just be dead anyway. If I'm dead because of this woman, it doesn't matter because my kids can't speak to me because I'm dead. So if I get out of here, but I'm alive and they don't talk to me, at least I'm alive. Because he was starting to realize she was sucking him completely dry. And therefore there was no amount of money he would not pay to be done with her. She had become a liability to him. And unfortunately, there were also a great number of people who were still taken in with her facade and how together she seemed to have had it. Wow, look at Chris, she's, she seems like she's really got her shit together. She's got so many little kids. She's running a household. She's a great wife to him. She's so supportive of his career. She's got her shit together. And people would be so taken in by that that they would not, and also here's the thing, they didn't know who she was genuinely at the, at, the, at the end of the day when the facade came off. So as an outsider looking in, it was easy for her to make it appear as if she had this fantastic loving family and look at how great she was at juggling all the balls that were up in the air. And look at how successful Robert's career was. Wow. So he had then quickly also realized there was nothing to say that would awaken those around him that did not wish to see, these are his words, the demon that Chris actually was. People, this was his concluding, Robert's conclusion, uh, people were simply too, inver uh, too invested to see what they believed about her and about the world around them. Otherwise, because if they did stop to actually see, they would have to question their own judgment and most people would rather not. So perhaps if you yourself have been involved with a person like this and you fail to understand why so many people seem to be taken in by them and take their sides, it's because of this. This is what Robert is sharing with us. That in his experience, also understand he's crossed over. He's on the other side now. So he has the elevated vantage point. And what he's sharing from that elevated vantage point is that when he was getting ready to divorce her and he saw all of these people that were like taking her side, and he's like, whoa, what the fuck is going on here? He came to understand it was because of the facade that she was um, operating and that people were so taken in by it and that for them to come to understand that she was not who she had pretended to be would then call all of their judgment under question. And then those people would start to question, well, if I was so wrong about her, what else might I be wrong about in the entirety of my life? And that's just too complicated. And most people would rather not do that. So people will buy into the facade that they believe because without buying into the facade, the entirety of their perceived world around them could start to crumble. So it's kind of like the lies we tell ourselves, right? They're willing to buy this lie because it keeps them feeling safe. And what are they feeling safe from or against? Their actual bad judgment. This person is not who I thought them to be. How could I be so wrong? And if I'm so wrong about that, what else might I be wrong about as well? Now, it was precisely Chris's ability to zero in on a weakness that enabled Chris to convince Kim and her then boyfriend, um, I think he was like a R&B artist by the name of Ray J, to do a sex, a sex tape. Because this is how Kim initially rose to fame. Um, she was, kind of, I, 
maybe she was just like uh, like the tag along to um, Paris Hilton. I think she was like Paris Hilton's um, like friend and makeup artist or like the tag along that would just go along to clubs that Paris Hilton would go, go to, but she wasn't really well known. And then the sex tape hit. So Chris understood that Kim was self-conscious about her looks. So Chris had told her it would change people's perception of her and therefore she would be seen as sexy. And because Kim was self-conscious, especially like being next to like a, a Paris Hilton, Paris Hilton is long and lean and very slender. She's tall, she's skinny. And then by, con you know, she has the blonde hair, blue eyes. And then by contrast, you had Kim Kardashian, who was, um, you know, average height, maybe like 5'5 five, five or so. Very, very voluptuous, even prior to doing all of the um, enhancements to her physical uh, appearance. She was very, very voluptuous, right? Dark hair, dark eyes, dark skin. They were like night and day. And because Paris was the one that was more popular and more successful, that also um, was something that had created this self-consciousness in Kim because like she's the gold standard of what people want to see. Tall, skinny, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes, and she was the complete opposite. So Chris understanding this was one of Kim's weaknesses had actually been able to manipulate her and Ray J into doing the sex tape that it would be good for both of their reputations and both of their images. In this way, Chris is absolutely diabolical because she has no regards for anyone's, and I did put this in quotations, she has no, no regards for anyone's feelings because she herself does not have any. So she doesn't understand them. Again, she's very much an ends justify the means kind of a person. Okay, Kim, I see what the problem is. This is what we're going to do to remedy the problem to your self-consciousness. You're going to put out a sex tape with Ray J and then everyone's going to see you as sexy and that's going to sh shift their perception of you. Did it matter that they were going to be doing a sex tape in order to, like, re really? Of all the ways to remedy a person's reputation, this was the route that was chosen. Okay. Speaks volumes. Kylie was insecure about her looks. So, what was the solution there? To get tons of plastic surgery to transform her so that she could then launch her cosmetic line. Everyone to Chris was a pawn on a chessboard to move and maneuver at will for her ultimate success. Because here's the crazy thing. Her ultimate success came at a very steep price. And the ultimate success of her children did as well. And here's why. You want your name to be a household name. What are you willing to pay to play? And what has come out time and again in so many of the um, other AMAs that we have done, which we have looked into uh, celebrities, is that if somebody is a household name, but you don't know them personally, it's because they are in the club. Period, the end. And no, I'm not talking about like, there's someone in your community, but you haven't met them, but you know them by name and you know them by face. That's not what I mean. If you don't know a celebrity personally, but you know their name because they are a celebrity, that is an indication that they are in the club. You simply do not become a household name without joining the club. It's not possible. They won't allow it. They are the gatekeepers. So what are you willing to pay to play? Chris was willing to pay 
anyone or anything, just not herself. She had all these kids though. Hmm. Interesting. She was shown to me here at this point as a representation of either being a mouse or a rat on a sinking ship. If you are ever on a sinking ship and you don't know up from down or right from left, follow the direction the vermin are going in because they have an instinct to survive against all odds. There is no reason it is said that in a nuclear holocaust, the rats in New York would survive. They are hardy. They are survivalists. They have adapted. They have adapted to the poison that is sprayed in the subway system in New York to survive it nonetheless. Nonetheless, Chris is cut from the same cloth. She is a survivalist. She will survive at any cost. She is, if you will, one of those rats on a sinking ship. And instinctively, she knows what way is up when everybody else is floundering and they don't know what way is up. That is a very, very dangerous weapon to wield against people. And since everyone was around her, everyone around her was a commodity, right? Because everyone around her, she looked at them as a pawn on a chessboard to be moved and maneuvered. Since everyone around her was a commodity to be traded, she had no qualms about selling the souls of her daughters to ensure her ultimate success. Now, also, this is where I'm going to remind you what came through at the beginning, which is as the so-called momager, she was getting a 10% cut of all of the success, financial success of her children. That sounds, that sounds great. That sounds fucking fabulous. And now knowing how much money all of her kids have earned, think of how much money she has earned through them. Those are great fucking pieces on the chessboard she has been playing with. Because not only is the Kardashian name a household name, we all know her kids' names. So she had no qualms selling the souls of her daughters, but not her own. Because she would have no problem allowing the bodies of her kids to be inhabited, selling them out for her and for their success, which was again also her success. So they, they could never actually enjoy it, but because she was the one that would remain in her body, she would actually get to. That's why it's so completely diabolical. She was selling her kids out for their success, which would in turn also guarantee her further su success, but because they were inhabited and they were taken over, they never even got to enjoy it. But she did because her kids are just pawns on a chessboard. Now, if you want to know what does selling the souls of your daughters look like, it can show up in any number of ways. And here's how. So first and foremost, I have a whole list. I'm gonna break them all down. Not in any particular order, because one is not more important than the other. It's just to say that these are, in the case of the Kardashian clan, this is how the kids were sold out. So number one, using her kids to push a particular agenda forward, such as Kim and Chloe being uh, more voluptuous and perhaps having even had a Brazilian butt implant getting um, which one was it um, which daughter was it it was the one that with the makeup line um, Kylie Kylie got hip implants as well 
uh, got a got a butt implant. Go back and look at the pictures of the way that uh, all the, the all the girls had looked prior. We're not just talking about the cosmetic procedures that they had had to their face, but the body procedures and the body altercations that they have had as well. That was designed to push forth a particular agenda. What is considered to be beautiful in the uh, the beauty industry? So for a time. <clears throat> excuse me, it was having big butts. It was having those big, I mean, now we can look at it and be like, they don't even look real because they're not real. But having these <clears throat> over-exaggerated um, hips that were artificially created. So that was done first and foremost to push forth a particular agenda. What is considered to be beautiful? And then now look at how their appearance has changed over the years. Where they went from having the, the big, big ass and the the exaggerated hips to now um kind of like looking like they have a uh, heroin chic so they're almost like emaciated so the big ass is gone now they have those skinny little asses now they're skinny now they're, they they even like look on all over their body that's pushing forth a particular agenda what is considered to be beautiful it was big and and voluptuous now it's skinny and and waif like so it's also to keep society energetically on a disempowered state, because what are all of those people gonna do that had the butt implants? What, they're just gonna take it out now because it's not considered to be like in style any longer? Are they gonna take out their hip implants? Are they now all gonna go on Ozempic also and become like dangerously uh, thin because like that's considered to be the beauty standard right now? That's number one. Number two, look at the fact all of them have had cosmetic procedures done to their face, and they have all continued to deny it. Very, very notable, one could say. So what is that doing? That is, first of all, reinforcing a person's um, inability to trust what they believe with their own eyes. Because you can go back, there are so many accounts on Instagram or online that shows like before and after pictures. It is undeniable that they have all had incredible amounts of cos cosmetic procedures done to their face. So it's first of all a way of denying what everybody can perceive with their own eyes and it's a way of telling people don't believe what don't believe what you see believe what we tell you. Second of all it's where there is now this next generation that is coming up where they are kind of like seeing these impossible beauty standards. How can they keep up, how can they possibly keep up with it? How can they possibly even begin to determine first and foremost what is considered to be beautiful if like from five years to the next, their appearances have completely changed, right? I would, what should I do? How should I dress? Who, how, who am I? What can I even be in this world where the standards continuously um, change, but not where they're changing, where there is such a huge variation in terms of the change? Big ass, no ass. Fake hips, no hips. Voluptuous, skinny. Cosmetic procedures. Don't believe what you see with your eyes. Believe what we tell you. We haven't had any cosmetic procedures done. And then think of people growing up and thinking that. Why don't I look like that? I haven't had any work done and I don't look that way. They haven't had any work done and they look that way. Impossible beauty standards. So that's one of the ways in which your, the souls of your children being sold out can manifest. Number two using your kids to push a particular lifestyle forward, such as having kids out of wedlock. Um, both Kylie and Courtney have had multiple children out of wedlock. So this is, if you will, piggybacking off of the show that had come out um, maybe 10 years or, or so. What was it called? Like 16 and Pregnant? And it appeared on MTV, right? So what did 16 and Pregnant show? They followed like a, a couple of girls who got pregnant at 16 and they decided to keep their baby. So it was a way of, if you will, almost like making it popular, making it almost like it's okay. Like it's okay. Look, it's okay. Other people are doing it. Not only are other people doing it, but they're doing it and they're ending up on TV because of it. So this was piggybacking off of it, but not where it was showing them being 16 and getting pregnant, but it's where they're in like the so-called higher socioeconomic status. They're in a higher echelon, one could say. What's the higher echelon? They're also in, on TV, but they're like 
so, so, so incredibly successful. They're like millionaires in their own right. So not only can like 16 year old girls who maybe don't know better, not only can they do it, anyone can do it. We can all do it. All right, number three, using her kids as energetic vacuum cleaners to energetically suck their partners dry and extracting something in particular from them without their partners knowing it or actually even consenting to it. So what had come out in that AMA that I had done was that the Kardashians are black widows. And what are black widows? They are the spiders that will mate, the female spiders will mate with the male spider and upon the conclusion of the mating, will kill them. They got it, they got what they needed, they don't need the males around any longer. Not, and also here's the thing, not just that they don't need the males around any longer, the males actually have no val value any longer. They kill them outright. So it's not like you're allowed to go off and be merry and live your own life after you've mated with me. I will mate with you and then you will die. You have no value beyond mating with me. This is what the Kardashians do. They will partner up with men in which they want to extract something particularly from them that they want from them because they are energetic black widows. Now, interestingly, what was shown to me about Rob Kardashian, who is the only son in the family, is that he is worth notably so much less than all of the Kardashian girls. So what, whereas they are in the 60 million and above, he is only, only, he is only worth $10 million. And why is that notable? Now, again, this is coming from it with the understanding that all the girls in the family are black widows and they are energetically siphoning off particular things that they wanted or needed from their partners. It's not just only the romantic male partners in their life. It's also any male in their life, including their own brother. So because of that, Rob was kept in such an energetically low state because of the fact of growing up around all of these black widows and the continuation of the siphoning of his own energy off of him, that he then therefore is not going to show up in the three-dimensional world with the same level of success that his sisters have. And you might be wondering, okay, that's what like that's what they do on their free time. What does that have to do with them like being part of the club and having sold their souls out? Aha. It is so much more nuanced than that. There is so much more depth to that, which I will give you a little teaser here, but it comes up later on, which is not only that are, are they in one club, which is let's say the Hollywood club, the Hollywood elite, they are also in an additional club as well. They are in a coven of witches. So the extraction of their partner's energy very much pertains to the coven that they are in. To be explored a little bit later on. Number four, using her kids for branding purposes, which of course Chris gets a cut of. She gets 10% of every lucrative, lucrative deal her offsprings make. So not only is she using them as pawns on a chessboard, it behooves her to make deals that are the most financially lucrative to her because she will get a larger cut of it, irrespective of what that deal is. Is this even good? Who the fuck cares? I'm making money off of it. Number five. Um, Creating this perception that oversharing and a narcissistic lifestyle is first and foremost, not just normal, but perfectly okay, because look, everybody's doing it now. So there's a show. They were on a show for 20 years, more than 20 years at this point, called Keeping Up With The Kardashians. What happened on the, sh on the show? They opened up their lives for all to see and appear as if it is real and reality because it's called reality TV. Meanwhile, it's scripted. And it was scripted in such a way to elicit certain kind of responses or to make the shows particularly viewable, whatever the particular motivation behind it was. But it was kind of like reinforcing this negative and toxic idea 
that oversharing is completely normal and everybody does it. And what kind of society has that then therefore created? It has created, if you will, an entire society of, um, or an entire generation is a better way of saying it, not of actual narcissists, but the people that are exhibiting very, very high levels of narcissistic traits and qualities. Sharing things that are of no actual value to anybody else. It's sharing for the sake of sharing. Like, do I really need to go on Instagram and see somebody like cleaning their apartment? Do I need to see them taking their cat to the vet and talking about what is wrong with their cat? Stop and think about this for a moment. Do we really need to see that? Do we really, because this is why I'm really not on social media any longer. Do we really need to see people oversharing to the extent where they're taking us along while they get their mani-pedi and talking about how they needed their mani-pedi so badly and they're showing their actual dirty ass fucking toes and their dirty ass fucking feet and their toenails that are really, really long, and then zooming in on the minutia of their nails so you can first and foremost see not only how badly their gel manicure has grown out, but how badly their, their cuticles look. I ask you, do we really need to see it? No, but this is something that has been normalized by the Kardashians because we're keeping up with them. And here's also the thing, in tandem with the rise in all of these oversharing in social media has also increased the rate of depression and anxiety. They have risen in tandem. You want to know how you can undermine the next generation of people. One great way to do it is through social media and to make it seem as if everyone's life is better than theirs and that if they don't overshare, they have no value because they're not getting the dopamine hit of the likes or the comments or the fucking whatever. Great way to undermine the next generation coming up. Number six, allowing your kids to be inhabited by entities. And this is one of the big ones. So if all the other five weren't bad enough, this is the big one because what do we know about what Chris had done? She sold out her children. So while they were not in their body to enjoy their own success, she would never sell out her own body so she could be in it and she could enjoy her success. And how do we know this? The particular agenda that is being put forth by her children is, um, especially as it comes to like the beauty standards, what they do with their bodies and how they, um, adorn them, is that this was to put forth, put forth a particular agenda, but in addition to that, what was being done with it, that is a representation of the preferences of the entity that was inhabiting their body. So those particular entities that were in at one particular time would like having a big ass. And then however long amount of time later, they got tired of the big ass, now they wanna have no ass. It's akin to how we would change our jewelry. But they're doing it with cosmetic surgeries to their faces and to their bodies. And why? Because they are not even in their body to feel it. These are probably very, very big surgeries that they are undergoing. They're not even there. They don't even feel it. This is akin, again, to me changing the necklaces that I'm wearing. I'm wearing gold, now I wanna wear silver. I wear gold earrings, now I wanna wear silver. I'm just adorning my body differently. This is the way that the entities inhabiting their body view the bodies that they are in. I'm just adorning my body differently. So it served, served multiple purposes. It was to put forth a particular, a particular agenda onto the world stage of what are considered to be so-called be beautiful and beauty standards. And it is also a reflection of the fact of the entities were expressing their preferences for how they like their body to be adorned. So specifically for the Kardashians, these are the six different ways in which the selling out of the souls 
would manifest in a three-dimensional level, uh, three-dimensional layer for all the world to see. Now, while Chris allowed this to happen to her kids, none of this would actually happen to herself. And what was also shown to me is, <coughs> excuse me, she has no particularly uh, no particular loyalty to what is the agenda that was being put forth. None whatsoever. Who's paying me? And who's paying me the most amount of money? So she is aligned with darker nefarious energies. And that is why darker nefarious things were done to the, cho the, the bodies of her children and the agendas that were putting for being put forth. But let's say for example, somebody had approached her and they had wanted to have the children put forth a particular kind of agenda, such as like, um, I'm trying to think of like what's so diametrically opposed to what they have stood for. Plastic surgery is no good. Everybody, like natural beauty is the way to go. We all wanna be natural now. Even if that is completely diametrically opposed to everything that they have stood for in the past and how they themselves had procured and undergone a great number of cosmetic procedures and then denied it. If someone had come to her with an enormous amount of money and wanting to put this agenda forth, it would be like as if these other things had never even existed. She would suddenly have all of them taking out all of their, uh, whatever it is that they had done to themselves and re resorting back to the original way in which they would have showed up in the world. And then they would all be saying, we have had cosmetic procedures, but no, natural is the way to go right now. And that's why we're coming out and we're using our voices for it. Never mind that it's like, you're gonna get whiplash. Like, well, okay, so what is it? You, you had it, but you didn't have it because you said you didn't have it. But now you're saying you did have it and you don't think that people should have it. So now you're gonna come out and you're gonna say like, what I, in her mind, it wouldn't have made any difference that it was diametrically opposed, that it wasn't in line with something that she had done in the past. She would look at it and she would be like, who is willing to pay the most amount of money? You are? All right, give me the money, I don't care, whatever. She is all about, remember the gens, ends justify the means. She is all about the bottom line. And what is the bottom line to her? She, ensuring her success and that she is in her body to enjoy her success and in procuring the highest paid deals for her children so she gets a cut a cut of it never mind them they're not even in their bodies to enjoy it or appreciate it never mind them she has no particular loyalty to any agenda or message or purpose none even if it's diametrically opposed to something that she had done in the past so therefore, because Kris Jenner has no loyalty, loyalty to any particular agenda, as long as she and they are handsomely rewarded, she has then, um, she has set themselves up for enormous monetary success. And therefore she has also become well known in the industry as being somebody that is amenable to agreeing to any particular agenda. She is then therefore an energetic pimp to her kids where she has turned them into energetic prostitutes for herself and her own financial gain. Now, what was also shown to me in addition to them being um, energetic prostitutes, the girls, as well as Chris, are all pretty high up in the club, but not just in the club, but as witches, as they are casting spells on all the products they put their names on. They are also witches because of the energetic extraction purposes the, curl, the girls do to their partners as they themselves are black widows. I'm gonna talk more about this. Uh, 
every product they sell with any of their names on it has some sort of spell cast on it. Now the girls love to siphon off the male's energy to collect it inside of themselves and at their witch meetings with the others that are there and are also the so-called witches in the club. They will release it for all of them to share. And it is, was shown to me as being like a drug to them. But more than that, they have a fascination with emotions as it's something they themselves do not understand. Why don't they understand it? Most of the fucking time, they're not even in their own bodies. So it's kind of like trying to explain color to a blind person. These entities that are inhabiting their body don't understand emotions. So it's like a fascination to them. Oh, tell us more about this. Notably, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the ways in which the um, energy was siphoned off of the partners. Notably, I was shown Kim's wedding to Chris Humphreys and that she had so-called blindsided him after 72 days of being wed by saying that she wanted a divorce. So what was she siphoning off of him was the feeling uh, she was feeling all of his emotions, siphoning off all of his emotions and his sadness, his shock, surprise, and hurt was siphoned off of him. And then it was released almost like imagine, um, like a, a, a gas being released out of a canister. So the tendrils of it was released at a meeting with these so-called other witches in which they studied with fascination. And then what the girls themselves would then use on keeping up with the uh, on keeping up with the Kardashians, their TV show, was they would try to then portray emotions they themselves don't have to make it seem as if it was genuine. And they don't have genuine emotions. So they Kim was genuinely married to Chris Humphreys because he was like a well of emotions that she could tap into and siphon off of him. And then therefore the purpose of that was to release it at the meeting with the other witches and with the other Kardashian girls, which they would then sift through it. Like imagine you're at a flea market and there's a bin of clothing and you're sifting through it to see if there's anything that you want in the bin. So they were sifting through all of the emotions that she had siphoned off of him, sifting through it to see, oh, what can I utilize for the next episode to make it seem like I have something I myself genuinely, I, that, to make it seem like I have an emotion inside of myself that I genuinely do not have inside of myself. And why would they need to do this? They needed to do this because they have no emotions because they no longer have souls. They are bodies that are housing entities. Their souls have stepped out. The lights are on in no one's home. Now, what was also shown to me is that Kim is much more overt and like a bomb going off. So whereas Kim energetically, I mean, it just, here's the thing also just like look like, not to say look at it like her appearance, but it's like, Everything she does appears to be very like big and over the top, right? Like Kim is, Kim is kind of like a go big or go home kind of a girl. Like what was her introduction into the public domain? It was a fucking sex tape. How many times has she been married? Three. So she, she's very, very big and over the top with all of the actions that she does. So whereas you can have a, a Kim who is much more overt and over the top like a bomb going off, there is Courtney who is very much the opposite. Courtney, conversely, seems so quiet and unassuming and that was why her extraction of Scott Disick, her partner for many years, 
took so long. He, Scott Isaac, was in a tailspin because of how slowly she extracted his energy and how slowly he then therefore lost his mind. And they all enjoyed watching it while pretending to be concerned about him. Scott was, if you will, the energetic louche gift that kept on giving. And that's why he and Courtney were together for so long. Now, in case this term louche is something that you're only now starting to hear and it's not something that you're familiar with, louche is, if you will, the energetic and emotional output that a person contributes into the world. It's, if you will, it's going to sound like a funny example, it's, if you will, like perspiration. So how do you know that somebody is hot and perhaps that they've been working out? They're perspiring, they're sweating. And then the physical manifestation of that, right? The sweat, what happens to it? It evaporates. That is very much the way that louche also works. Louche is what is our emotions and our attention, what are we giving our attention and our, and our focus to? And what then therefore is that going to elicit a certain kind of response in us that will contribute to our releasing of louche? So imagine if you will, louche is the emotions that we ourselves genuinely feel, but it is something that can be siphoned off of people and it can be collected and it can be fed on by the entities that are on the astral realm. Now I have done a video on this explaining it. I have linked it down below if you wanna go back and you wanna watch that video. Louche is very much real. Louche is the accumulation and collection of any particular feeling and emotion that you have, but it's also not just feeling, it's attention. So what, if you are feeling anxious, or if you are feeling scared, if you are feeling depressed, if you are feeling overwhelmed, if you are feeling on anything that's going on in your own life, but then imagine how much more that can be amplified, like taking a magnifying glass to that emotions that you yourself are feeling, but where there is the um, accumulation of all of those emotions on a big grand scale. Because let's say if, if let's say there are certain events in history that have been orchestrated with the express purpose of creating these very, very big and notable events that are eliciting a certain kind of a response in people. And then that then is the accumulation of massive amounts of louche. And it's not just off of one person, it's off of all of those people. And here's some examples. Think, if you will, to uh, the first one that always comes uh, to mind for me, being an American and being in New York at the time that this happened, September 11th, right? So the Twin Towers came down. Think of, first and foremost, on that particular day, the shock, the collective shock that we were all experiencing. Then think in the aftermath, uh, aftermath of it, the sadness, the fear, the grief, the mourning. And then on top of it, it's memorialized every single year where every single year on September 11th, there's some sort of a event that happens there where all the names of all of the victims that died on that day are read. So it is re-traumatizing the experiences that the family had by shockingly losing a loved one on that particular day, but it's done under the guise of recognizing the family members that they had lost. In actually what they're doing is every single year they are recreating micro tears in the energy of those families so that they can continue to acquire the louche off of them. What are some other examples as well? War. Young kids are going off to war, they're never coming home. Think of the devastation that is being caused by wars. Massive accumulation of louche that can be collected. You want to get people riled up into a frenzy, here's another great way of doing it. 
by orchestrating, this is just for example, I'm not saying this is what they're doing, but just for example, creating a war between two countries and making one appear to be the aggressor and one appear to be the victim and then getting everybody to direct all of their hatred towards the country that is appearing to be the aggressor in the war. And then they're showing so much support for the other country that is the so-called victim of the war that they are putting up you know bumper stickers of that country's flags on their car and they are perfectly okay with millions and millions and billions of dollars being sent over to the country of that the the victim country in that um in that particular war right we have to score that they're they're just hapless victims so all of these things are or can be in orchestration of events that are designed to first and foremost capture the attention of the world globally to elicit a particular response of all of the people that are having those experiences on a global scale and then siphoning all of that off because it is as i had shared in the first example like perspiration it oozes and emanates from us. And just like the perspiration would start to evaporate, the louche and all of the attention and all of the emotions that have been orchestrated is evaporating off of us and being sucked up by the entities on the astral realm. That was a very long aside, but just in case this is the first time you have heard about this idea of louche, I really wanted to give you the context of what it is. So Scott, <laughs> though he be one and not many, Scott Disick was the louche gift of the Kardashian family that kept on giving. And that is why Courtney stayed with him so long because she was collecting massive amounts of louche from him, which was then shared with her sisters and the other witches in their coven. Now, what was also shown to me is even Chloe calling Scott Disick Lord Douche was meant to cut him down to size. Now, I'm also going to interject with another aside right here, which is to say, I have personally never seen a single episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians. This is not a judgment. If you have, I'm happy for you. You do you, boo, right? Like, we just don't judge here. But I personally have never seen a single episode of the Kardashians. So me referencing this is not because I know from firsthand knowledge. Why am, and why am I saying this? It's because how I came to acquire this knowledge that he was called Lord Douche. This was reported in a magazine that I used to read religiously for many, many, many years. I had a subscription to Us Weekly for, I'm not even going to, uh, I'm not even going to like, lie probably 15 years or longer it's shameful i know i was asleep very asleep back then um but so that that is therefore also share me sharing this with you is to give you an, uh, an idea of the way that the accumulation of loosh works if you are not going to get people's attention one way let's say they're not watching the kardashians guess the fuck what it's going to be talked about in magazines such as Us Weekly or People or OK or any of the other rag mags, you're still going to circumvent that person's, sure, yes, I, I could choose not to read an article about it. Us Weekly was relatively small. It was exciting. I would read every fucking line on every fucking page. It's a way to circumvent a person's willingness to participate in giving their attention to something where it's like, hey, look, even if you're not going to watch the show, we're still going to get your attention this way. And I'm sure there's many people that actually got like sucked into watching the show after reading about it in the rag mags. But this was also done by design, which was to say that she said it on the show. And her saying it on the show was meant to cut him down to size to all of the viewers of Keeping Up with the Kardashian. Then this was in turn written up about in all of the rag mags. And it was then also continuing to further contribute to the character assassination of Scott Disick to the readers of all of the rag mags. 
and to also circumvent their free will in their participation of wanting to give their energy, focus, and attention to something of this nature. It served many purposes. So the fact that this was done on national TV made it even sweeter. National TV, um, domestic publications, probably even like publications in other countries, made the cutting him down to size and the character assassination of Scott Disick, which was part of the accumulation of his louche, made it so much sweeter for them. This is what's going on behind the veil. It is no wonder then that after the conclusion of Scott Disick's relationship with Courtney, he then went on to date a 20-year-old Sophia Ritchie. And why? He wanted to be with the least threatening person he could find after being with Courtney. Twenty-year-old innocent little Sophia Ritchie fit the bill perfectly. So while yes, we can look at it and we can be like, oh, he's so gross, he's so disgusting. He went on to date a girl so much younger than him. Understand what was going on behind the veil. He was a incredibly wounded and damaged soul at the conclusion of his coming out of the relationship with Courtney. That he needed to find the least threatening person it wasn't because he wanted to manipulate her. It wasn't because it's like, I want to date a younger model. I want to have sex with a younger body. She was just not threatening to him. And that's exactly what he needed after the conclusion of the relationship, behind the veil. So understand a lot of the things that we see playing out in the world around us appears to be one way, but when we peel back the three-dimensional veil, we understand that it's so much more complex and nuanced. Now, I'm not gonna make an excuse for a lot of men that, that can legitimately, I'm not gonna call them a douche, but can behave in a douche-like manner. There are a great number of you know, 80-year-old men that wanna marry 30-year-old women, right? And that's why things like this happen. 80-year-old men are probably not having sex with a 30-year-old woman though. There is something that is going on behind the veil that is bringing those two souls together though. So while on the three-dimensional level, it probably appeared as if Scott Disick was a douche and he was dating a younger woman because he wanted a, I, frankly, I can't even, like, I think there was like a 15 year age difference, right? Like I can't imagine it. Okay, that's my own thing. But again, understanding it was something going on behind the veil that was designed on his part to heal him by being with a woman that was the least threatening to him and it wasn't about him wanting to date a younger woman per se. Okay. It wasn't for like control purposes. Now, if that is not bad enough, even after the fact that Scott's reputation had taken a hit um, on the show, right? By being called, what is it? Lord Douche or Douche Lord or whatever it is that she had called him. His reputation continued to take a hit thereafter, and how so? Because of how fast Courtney and Travis Barker got married. Scott was with Courtney for a great number of years. They had four kids together, but he never got married to her. He never put a ring on it. And Travis, however, did. I think, how long were they together? Like 10 months before they decided to get married? Okay. So this was shown to me as being a very passive aggressive way to throw shade at Scott Disick. He didn't put a ring on it. They had kids together and he didn't even marry her. But look, look what a good guy, good guy Travis is. Now, Courtney is now being used to continue to capture and draw attention as she herself has been rebranded to be with Travis. She is now representing as a darker and edgier version of herself 
And this is also done to sell and push a particular agenda. What's that you may ask? She is pushing not to judge a book by its cover because sometimes the diamonds are in fact hidden in the rough. Travis is a diamond in the rough because look, he was willing to marry a woman after only being together with her for like 10 months and she also has four kids. What an incredibly noble guy he is. This is also done to contrast Scott Disick's apparent clean cut appearance, but he didn't marry her. But Travis, the hard around the edges looking guy did. So maybe then we should to then date men that look like that, because if she had her happy ever, uh, her, if Courtney had her happy ever after with Travis, who was rough around the edges and not clean cut at all like Scott, perhaps we can too. But hold on, this might be where you might be asking, hold on Faye, you always tell us if you want to know who someone is, look at what they do and look at what is around them because that will tell you what kind of vibration they have, right? Right. That is for regular folk. That's for the 99 percenters. That's for the people that are not on TV. That's for the people you know in your own life. Because again, if someone is a celebrity and they are a household name and you do not know them personally, you know their name because they are in the club. So in this particular case, this is a agenda that is being pushed forth. I'm also going to go on to say that um, Travis is also on, under some sort of mind control. Now, this is not to say that because he is under mind control that he did not like Courtney. And it's not even to say that he doesn't necessarily love Courtney either. It's just to say that the speed in which things moved and that it was so much at an accelerated rate is an indication that there are other factors going on behind the veil, such as mind control. He is under mind control. So what did bring these two together? Was it a setup or was it love? And this is what was shown to me. Anything Chris does is to maximize the exposure of her family. Period. The end. She is a branding machine. So she, in her branding machine brain of hers, had realized that Courtney was due for a branding and image change. So she had dreamed this up. It was time for Courtney to have her glow up. It's Courtney 2.0. This is not the doting and adoring woman that stayed with a partner for so many years, even though he was not going to marry her. The woman that had four children with him, even though he was not going to marry her. This is the woman that is fully embodied in herself now. She knows who she is and she knows what she wants. And what does she want? She wants Travis. He's the diamond in the rough that was going to marry her and her four kids. So Courtney was due for a rebranding and image change. So she had actually, yes, she had dreamed this up. There were a number of other names on the list of the so-called edgier looking men that were the prospective mates for Courtney. But Courtney and Travis were actually most of an energetic match, which is why these two did end up together. Um, which is another way of saying that Courtney was not energetically aligned behind the veil with any of those other prospective suitors that were on the list. She was, however, most energetically aligned with Travis. And here's why. 
Travis has routinely allowed himself to be inhabited by other entities while playing drums, and that is why he is such a good drum player. Also, look to his body and how many tattoos he himself has. Because what do we know about tattoos? Those tattoos tell a story. All tattoos tell a story. But when someone is tattooed to the max, and it's not just like, I went through a particular experience and I really want to memorialize it on my body by having some sort of tattoo as a reminder to it. Or someone maybe lost one of their children so they have like their, their kid's name tattooed on their body or they have their likeness tattooed on their body. When someone is choosing to tattoo their body to the extreme, to the max, such as Travis, who is cut, like, I don't know what percentage of his body is tattooed, but it's more than the ordinary. Not that I know what the ordinary is, but it's like to the max. When someone is doing that and they are in the industry, this is a clear indication of them trying to regain their masculinity because of the fact that they have been emasculated. And how have they been emasculated? Specifically, if they are in the music industry, um, and I've done a video on that, which is linked down below. You can go back and watch it if you want to. But specifically in the music industry, if somebody, for anyone to join the club in the music industry, it is through sodomy. And it is through sodomy with other members in the club that are above them in status. So they are being physically and sexually emasculated by the fact that they are being sodomized by another male higher up in the club. That is the entry, that is the pay to play in the music industry, specifically for males. It's different for women, but for specifically for men, that's the pay to play. So when a man has been emasculated to that extent, the excess of tattoos that they are choosing to adorn their body in is in effort to reclaim their masculinity and to make themselves appear to be harder and more rough around the edges. And it is also a form of cutting. And it is a cutting by proxy through somebody else because the trauma that they have endured is through somebody else. So the way to release the trauma is in a participation of somebody else, which is in this case, the tattoo artist that is administering the tattoos to them. So the fact that Travis is tattooed to the max is an indication of how much he had to endure to become a successful drummer in the industry. Okay, so his energetic blueprint has already been lowered because of it. It's been through the sodomy and it has been through opening himself up and to be inhabited to be the best possible drummer that he can be in any particular time that he's being a drummer. So, compromised energetic status. Now, Courtney was an energetic match for Travis because she had been energetically siphoning off Scott's energy like a vampire for decades. And she had engaged in nefarious activities for her placement in the club as well. Travis not only opened himself up to be inhabited by these entities, but the girls routinely do as well, just not Chris. Now, something that is quite interesting that had come through at this point, um, it was shown to me that first and foremost, uh, Chris will never allow herself not to be in control because she is a control freak, but she also had no qualms with the girls being um, opened up themselves and that she actually had um, not physical, not intimate, not sexual, but she had relationships of a, of a sort with the entities that had inhabited her daughters. And what does that mean? I'm going to explain it. 
So first and foremost, she is like a matriarch to the entities that inhabited her girls as well. And if you have seen, this is the way it was shown to me. If you have seen the movie Dune, which is based on a book, but I'm specifically calling out the movie, because if you have seen the movie Dune, there is a certain voice that the main character and his mother can use. And this voice that they use is not their own voice and it is used to uh, influence another person to do something. Or it's, if you will, another way of saying it is it's to bypass that person's free will and to make them do something. So go, if you haven't seen it, or maybe you can even just like look on YouTube for a clip of the voice that was actually used in the movie. It was shown to me as this voice, which is not a voice that I can even try to recreate, which is why I'm, I'm mentioning the movie and directing you if you're curious about it, that you can go see a clip of exactly the voice that was used. But it was shown to me, it's not, first of all, it's, and foremost, it's not like any voice, human voice, and it sounds rather otherworldly. This is the way that the voice of the entities that are inhabiting the daughters sound like when she is communicating with them. When she's communicating Chris to entity and not Chris to Kim, for example. And that she has had long lasting and deep conversations with these entities, talking directly to them while they're in her children. And she um, has had long lasting conversations asking about first and foremost, the astral plane, other entities, what they can see from their elevated vantage point, um, what they can see and what they can share with her about potential timelines, branding and business opportunities. But first and foremost, understand, because she is connecting to dark entities and not entities of the good, all of the potential business partnerships that are going to be um, solidified are not going to be of the good. Um, now, she is also so good at being a momager and that is in part due to the fact that she is connected to the other side, but it is not the divine portion of the other side. Like attracts like. What did she do to join the club? How did she sell herself out and sell out the souls of her kids to be in the club? Because even though she is not being inhabited and her kids are, what other nefarious things has she chosen to partake and participate in that would assure her spot, her elevated spot in the club. Again, this is an ends justify the means kind of a woman who doesn't have feelings, would not balk at any prospective thing that would be asked of her for her to contribute to, to join the club. That includes sacrifice. That includes spell casting. Use your imagination on anything else that it might include as well. She is an ends justify the mean kind of woman. She only wanted to assure, assure her own success. It didn't matter what she had to do to assure the success. Ends justify the means and a woman without any level of emotional empathy or regard. That's a deadly, a deadly combination. She is also so good at being a momager because she herself siphoned off all of Bruce Jenner's masculine energy over the years that they were married. So she is more akin to a Courtney style because how many years was she married to Bruce? Many. So during the duration of that relationship, she was creating all of those little micro tears in him and energetically siphoning off tiny little amounts over a long, pro, uh, prolonged period of time. And how do we know this to be true? Because Bruce now no longer identifies as Bruce, but he identifies as Caitlyn Jenner and he adorns and represents his body as being such, as being a woman. 
So this further illustrates that Chris and Bruce's mating season was very, very long. And that the mating season with any, uh, any of the girls mating seasons with their partners was designed to extract a certain particular outcome. From Bruce, it was masculine energy. From Robert, it was his intellect. This is talking about what Chris specifically wanted to siphon off of them. Bruce was a former Olympian, a very, very highly decorated former Olympian. I think he won something like seven gold medals in the Olympics. That's a lot of masculine energy. So that is why she chose to be with him to siphon off his masculine energy. She chose to marry Robert for his intellect. He was an attorney. For Courtney, it was actually Scott Disick's stability and balance. Because say what you want about him, this is the other perspective of him, which is not the negative perspective. Oh, he was with her for so many years and had four kids and he never married her. The other way of looking at it is, hey, look, he stayed with her for many, many years and having many kids together without being married. He was noble and he was doing the right thing. Whether or not he married her, he was there for his kids when they were little. So she slowly siphoned that off of him. And so that way she would then appear to be the balanced one while he slowly lost his mind and he became unhinged. It's so diabolical. Again, say what you want about him. Maybe you believe he really is a Lord douche or douche Lord. Maybe you really believe that he didn't do right by her because he didn't marry her. He had four kids with her and he didn't marry her and he stayed with her. He was the stable one. She siphoned it off of him. He lost his mind and she appeared to be the stable one. Okay. Now, what was shown to me about uh, Kim is that Kim, she was married three times. So Kim married somebody named Dom, uh, Damon Thomas, who was um, in the music industry. She had married him for exposure and his street smarts. She married Chris Humphrey because of his kindness and she married Kanye because of his mind, creativity, and inspiration. This right here is saying, what was she siphoning off of them? From Damon Thomas, it was his street smarts. From Chris Humphreys, his um, kindness and his um, emotional empathy. From Kanye, it was his, crea his mind, his creativity, and his inspiration. Now, Kylie Jenner, interesting, because I, I, I think I said we're touching on all of them. Kylie Jenner was with Travis Scott this is wild because she herself is so lost to herself. Chris felt she needed an infusion of dark energy via Travis and she had set and that Travis had set her on the so-called right path or the dark energy path, which is also the demonic path. Kylie was a lost soul. I think she's the youngest of all of them, right? Lost, spent her entire childhood being lost to herself. And Chris wanted to ensure that she was going to be on the so-called right path, which is the demonic path, which is why she orchestrated her getting together with Travis Scott, because Travis Scott is on the right path, i.e. the demonic path. So she is siphoning off some of his dark energy. Now, Chloe. Chloe is very, very interesting. This is what was shown to me about Chloe. Chloe has a tendency to go after emotionally unavailable men, which is an indication she has severe self-worth issues. And this was also shown to me as why she had weight problems as well. Chloe was always the... Um, slightly more, like I would even say beyond full figure. She was like a little bit chunky, right? So her being chunky was an indication of her self-worth issues, which also harkened back to her tendency to go after emotionally unavailable men. Chloe 
Chloe was also most affected by Chris and her various forms of abuse and was therefore the scapegoat of the family. You wanna know why Chloe has self-worth issues? It's because she was the scapegoat of the family. And what have we explored in other videos? When someone is showing up in a way in which they have excess body weight on them, that's an indication of trauma and them not feeling safe in the world. And therefore, the extra weight that they have on their body is a way of making them feel protected against the world. She didn't feel safe in the world because she was Chris's scapegoat. She bore the brunt of the abuse meted out by Chris. Now, Chris genuinely did not care what kind of men Chloe would go after. She didn't care. Because why? She didn't care about Chloe. Chloe was the scapegoat. She did not care about the kind of men that Chloe would get involved with. However, it's so fucking diabolical. She would low-key manipulate her into being with the emotionally unavailable men as well. So that would then confirm to Chloe the confirmation Chloe had, the confirmation bias that Chloe had about herself, which is she is not worthy of being with a man that's going to love her. Because what's an unavailable, unavailable emotion, un, emotionally unavailable man going to do? Probably gonna cheat, probably gonna ghost, probably gonna disappear for long periods at a time, probably not gonna treat you as well as you deserve to be treated. And all of those things were solidifying the confirmation bias that Chloe had about herself, which is she is unlovable. And what did Chris do? Chris didn't care. Chris did not care what kind of guy she was getting involved with because she didn't care about her. But she would um, mentally and emotionally manipulate her into guaranteeing she would be with these men because that would reinforce to Chloe that she was unlovable. But what also tends to happen, because all of these women are energetic vacuum cleaners, Chloe would also siphon off these men's lack of emotional regard. Emotionally unavailable means emotionally not checked in. So she was siphoning off their emotionally unavailable energy and lack of being tuned in thus reinforcing her energetically, which made her tougher so that Chris could then amplify the abuse against her. Because she is Chris's favorite punching bag in human form. Do you even understand how fucking diabolical this is? <sighs> By siphoning off the energy of uh, emotionally unavailable men, it was then therefore making Chloe tougher to break. And because Chloe is Chris's favorite person to met abuse out against, she wanted her to be reinforced. So that way she could continue to amplify the abuse that she was metting out towards Chloe. Because she was reinforced emotionally by the lack of emotional regard that she siphoned off from the men that she was involved with, which made her tougher to break. Because if without this, she would have been so easy to break, Chris would have lost her favorite toy to play with. So she would low key manipulate her into being with these unavailable, emotionally unavailable men so that she would siphon that off to reinforce her, to make her tougher to break so that Chris could torment her longer. behind the veil. So there's Chloe, who Chris has absolutely no regard for and can't stand and couldn't care less what happens to her. And then there's Kim. Kim is Chris's golden child. There's the scapegoat and then there's the golden child. Chloe was the scapegoat. Chris, uh, Kim is Chris's golden child. 
Chris feels she has molded her into absolute perfection and that she was willing to transfer Kim, because this had come up, come up in the AMA, Kim was willing to transfer her consciousness into another body to elevate the family's status. And what family was this? Not her family with Kanye, the Kardashians. Because who does Chris care about? Herself. So Kim's willingness to transfer her consciousness to, to elevate the Kardashian family status confirms that Chris has molded her to her ultimate perspective of perfection. Now, Kim also willingly threw herself into the witchery and anything that Chris had wanted her to do as she herself is so shut down and empty inside that she has no true core identity besides for the one that Chris has given her. And I was actually directed to look at what are the products on the market that she has created because that will actually shed a lot of light into her. Didn't she create like nudes, like the perfect nude lipstick, the perfect nude makeup, right? Basic, nude, basic. Her home collection and her home wares are also devoid of actual like design perspective. They're so basic. What is it? Like, I think I had seen something. It's like a, um, like a, this is so weird, like a concrete tissue box holder or something. And also look at her, her Skims collection, which is, I think, just like it's basic, um, like shapewear, right? Everything about her is, all everything that she's put out on the market is basic. And it's devoid of anything beyond being basic because she herself is devoid of anything. There is nothing to the products that she has put out on the market as that is a reflection of her. There's nothing there. Now, it's at this point after spending so much of my time poking around the energy of this family and being like, I get it. Behind the veil, there's all sorts of energetic dysfunction going on here. What's the takeaway? And this is what was shown to me. The show, first and foremost, being around all of these years later, is actually turning into a joke. The Kardashians are now turning into a punchline. So the joke is on them. Why? Because they are so drunk on their so-called relevance, but what happened to them after being on the E! News Network, which is a joke because if it's, it's not news, it's entertainment, right? But after being on the E! News Network for 20 years, they actually had to switch networks because no one was watching them anymore. But the people at E! News Network knowing who they are and how high up in the club and what they have done to assure their success didn't want to get on their bad side. So what did they do? They made working with them such a nightmare that the Kardashians wanted to actually leave the network. But they were basically dumped. E was making it harder and harder on them, hoping that they would leave when their contract was up, and they did. And that was because they didn't want to get on their bad side. But why did all of this go down? Because no one was really watching them anyway. They were stopping to be relevant. We're becoming too savvy for this kind of garbage TV. So what is shown to me is that they are actually turning into curiosities. Where people are now watching them as if people would watch animals in a zoo. They're curiosities. I wonder what they're going to do next. I wonder what they're going to do to their bodies next. I wonder what kind of um, scandal they're going to be embroiled in next. So the only reason people are tuning in now is because they are more like curiosities and animals in a zoo to be gazed upon. 
ultimately, because of all that they have chosen to participate in for the assurance of their actual success, they will get left behind because they are too much of a low energetic vibration for where we are going. We are all going to ascend and they will not. And this was shown to me. Imagine if you will, you are standing in a glass elevator. It's glass both on the inside and the outside. So if you're standing facing the inside of the building, you can see through the panels on either side of the doors that open, it's glass and it's glass. So you can see all the floors that you're rising above and you can also still see down to the first floor. And now if you turn the other way to the outside of the building, you're also going to see that it's glass um, on two sides. And you can then see, therefore see what is on the outside on a lower floor or as you are starting to rise up through the floors. So imagine if you will, we are all on a glass ensconced elevator and the elevator is going up and up and up and the Kardashians are still on the first floor. They are on the ground floor and while we are looking through the glass panels in the elevator, they appear to be being left behind. And they are being left behind. Because as we ascend energetically, as we are in that elevator going up, 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 no one is going to want to watch and be inundated with this kind of low vibration energy any further. And they can only create low vibration energy because that's an expression of the energy they themselves are. So that is my Behind the Veil energy read on the Kardashians. I hope that you have found this video to be interesting, insightful, maybe even thought provoking. Take what resonates, leave the rest behind, and as always until next time, stay in the high vibration.